Wonderful. Am I coming through there? Very good. So it's my honor to introduce Professor Nanshu Liu, uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin in both aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics and in biomedical engineering. And in her talk, you're going to see how those two pieces fit together. Uh, she's been at Austin since 2011 and was tenured and promoted associate professor in 2017. She's won a large number of honors, including the Technology Review 35 Under 35 and NSF, AFOSR, ONR, and 3M Young Investigator Awards. Uh, she received her PhD at Harvard and then was a Beckman Fellow at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. And her uh, laboratory's goal is to capture the information that our body radiates, our bodies radiate, uh, in using flexible, stretchable, and biointegrated electronics, uh, such as in electronic tattoos and implantable devices. So, uh, Professor Lou, welcome. Uh, we're delighted to have you as one of our rising stars. Uh, look, we're looking forward to your talk, uh, your perspective, and your wisdom. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Paul, for the uh, uh, kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Nan Shu from UT Austin. I'm currently in my home at Austin. And um, I would like to uh, express my um, gratitude and delightness to join uh, so many superstars and rising stars on um, ICANX uh, talk platforms which is now becoming probably one of the most influential online um, tech and uh, scientific um, uh, uh, webinar platforms. Thanks to, of course, uh, Professor Alice Zhang's uh, personal charm and uh, energy and the dedication. And um, I am also extremely honored and delighted because uh, today I am um, honored by uh, ACS Nano, as well as uh, our two Nano heroes, uh, Professor Paul Weiss and Professor Yuri Gogolti. Um, this is uh, going to be a, a very memorable moment. Um, so I am uh, happy to share with you our latest development for uh, multimodal uh, electronic tattoos. Um, so uh, why we are interested in this area um, is um, actually because um, nowadays uh, we see a huge trend uh, to um, uh, mimic, uh, for humans to mimic robots and for robots to mimic humans. And um, as uh, well put by Elon Musk, um, he said that humans uh, must merge with machines or become irrelevant in AI age. And uh, this kind of a vision for merging humans with machines and electronics is uh, shared by uh, already many ICANX speakers. If you followed ICANX talks, uh, including Professor John Rogers, uh, Professor Zhigang Suo, uh, Xuan He Zhao, uh, Chun Jiang Yu, um, Bing He, and uh, many um, uh, speakers uh, to come. So um, the ultimate goal, of course, uh, is uh, to be able to have a seamless um, interface between the two. Uh, however, if we uh, look at the reality, we can see that currently, um, on um, this uh, well-designed industrial machine, such as a car, there are more than thousands of sensors, but on our um, human body, uh, we rarely have uh, any um, reliable long-term um, unobstructive sensors, but we can think both of them as uh, machines. Uh, human body is just a soft machine, right? So um, both of the machines are radiating data um, about their um, health, readiness, and uh, specific to human body, uh, our emotion and intention. Um, there are multimodal data uh, radiated from our body, including um, physical data like uh, uh, temperature, electrophysiology, uh, and the mechanical data. Uh, <clears throat> 
uh, uh, in, uh, as well as mechanical data like uh, blood pressure, <laughs> motion, and <clears throat> even uh, including chemical uh, data such as uh, our um, uh, sweat analytes. So currently, <clears throat> however, we are not very well uh, digitizing our human body. So what are the op opticals here? Um, we can see that conventional, um, there are already a lot of conventional wearable devices trying to digitize our body for different purposes, uh, such as uh, mobile health, um, performance monitoring, um, human machine interaction, and so on. But uh, currently, uh, we um, see those as uh, bricks on straps um, because uh, they are based on uh, rigid wafer-based electronics <clears throat> and they're intrinsically uh, bulky and uh, um, <clears throat> obstructive. On the other hand, um, our vision actually uh, first proposed by Professor John Rogers uh, is to, uh, whether we can make those wearable electronics as thin, as soft as our skin, such that uh, we can patch them like a temporary tattoo sticker. Of course, to achieve this vision, there are many challenges uh, from the mechanical mismatch to low cost, high yield manufacturing, to long-term uh, wearability and biocompatibility, to power data handling, as well as uh, um, how do we really provide value to our users. Um, so therefore, uh, in my group, uh, we um, continue this vision uh, to uh, ultimately achieve those kind of uh, soft bioelectronic systems that are uh, really practical uh, for human body uh, digitization as well as uh, therapeutics. Um, so to uh, achieve this goal, we have to perform a fundamental research and my group is focusing on the following uh, four thrusts. Uh, one is the, the mechanics of uh, flexible and stretchable structures. Uh, this uh, is uh, a um, continuation from uh, my PhD work. And um, we are currently looking into the uh, mechanics of the uh, passive and uh, piezoelectric serpentine ribbons. Uh, those are stretchable and soft no matter what is the material. And uh, we are also um, looking at the uh, um, bending of uh, multi-layers with huge uh, elastic mismatch. And we <clears throat> have uh, discovered that um, the uh, conventional Euler Bernoulli beam theory of the linear distribution of the strain in the thickness direction um, completely breaks down. And we have found the split of neutral axis in those uh, stiff layers because the middle soft layer can endure enormous shear and uh, decouple the two layers. Um, today, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but it is uh, really uh, driven by mechanics findings. And the second area is uh, the manufacture and the transfer of those uh, soft stretchable electronics. And uh, we are uh, going to focus on the uh, cut and paste and later the cut solder paste process for the uh, free form digital manufacturing uh, of those uh, stretchable electronics uh, without using any uh, MEMS technology. And we are also um, collaborating uh, with other groups to study those uh, uh, water assisted transfer printing process. <laughs> After we uh, manufacture, we, we design and manufacture a good device. It doesn't mean it can always be successful and high fidelity because um, integrating electronics with uh, bio tissue is uh, very tricky. Uh, one, because the interface um, uh, may not have uh, those uh, most intimate connection. Um, we are looking into the bioelectronics interface, mostly uh, mechanical interaction between them because the mechanical interaction uh, is going to dictate the uh, thermal, electrical, optical interactions. And um, we also try to engineer a very more robust and reversible interface adhesion as, um, as those uh, inspired by uh, octopus uh, crater arrays. And we have done a lot of um, 
uh, mechanic studies for different uh, factors in, in the system. And this work uh, was uh, uh, completed by a previous uh, PhD student, um, Dr. Liu Wang. Now uh, he is looking at a wet uh, adhesion um, with Professor Xuan uh, He Zhao at MIT as a postdoc. So um, ultimately, we also want to incorporate uh, emerging nanomaterials such as 2D materials and recently also uh, carbon nanotubes um, to make uh, those electronic tattoo devices for their thickness and uh, intrinsic uh, mechanical robustness and advanced electronic and optical properties. I'm going to share a little bit about those uh, graphene electronic tattoos, uh, we call them uh, GETs. And uh, from our uh, fabrication, we also noticed a lot of uh, interesting defects um, when we transfer 2D materials onto various surfaces, for example, a lot of uh, micro tents or micro bubbles. And uh, we studied their intrinsic uh, mechanics uh, governed by the interface properties and uh, uh, the uh, intrinsic material properties of the 2D materials. And um, this uh, series of work is uh, completed by uh, a fresh a PhD graduate from my group, uh, Dr. Zhao uh, He Dai, and he is going to become a Mary Curie postdoc fellow at uh, Oxford University uh, this fall. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to cover too much of those details today because I'm going to focus on the mechanics and manufacture of those uh, um, electronic tattoo systems today. So um, if we look at uh, the uh, mechanical property contrast between uh, silicon and skin, we can see that um, silicon wafer is intrinsically rigid and uh, brittle, whereas our human skin is uh, intrinsically soft, curvilinear, and dynamic. Their um, Young's modulus mismatch can be as high as uh, six orders. And our skin does not rupture until 50, 60% strain. But when I stretch uh, our skin by 20%, we start to feel pain. So I call this 20% uh, to be the ouch limit. It's still 20% times uh, difference. So um, to overcome this kind of uh, huge uh, mechanical mismatch, um, there are uh, many uh, researchers focusing on developing intrinsically soft uh, organic electronics uh, represented by Professor Jenan Bao and, and uh, uh, Takao Somea and uh, many young uh, professors like uh, uh, Professor Chen Jiangyu and so on. So, um, but uh, for our uh, mechanics people, we adopt a purely mechanics approach, uh, which is by um, changing the geometry of uh, inorganic electronic materials like the metal, uh, silicon, um, uh, um, uh, 2D materials. So um, we know that um, by mimicking a three-dimensional spring, a two-dimensional uh, meandering shape, which we call serpentine ribbons, can um, still stretch and um, uh, uncoil and to achieve uh, high stretchability and high compliance, uh, essentially out of any materials. Um, and we can see when we stretch this by more than 100%, the intrinsic strain inside is less than 2%. Uh, we have done a lot of um, uh, theoretical and numerical modeling for this uh, um, serpentine design to uh, really minimize their um, uh, stiffness and maximize their stretchability. We also um, looked into their um, uh, softness, as we, you can see here, comparing a linear ribbon uh, with a serpentine ribbon of the same material, um, we can see that their stiffness can um, be reduced by orders of magnitude, um, even if we just uh, uh, change their geometry. We're not changing their uh, electronic property, optical property, or anything. It's purely a geometric shape change. And this kind of orders of magnitude reduction in stiffness gives us the hope to build really skin soft tissue like uh, electronics out of intrinsically uh, stiff materials. 
So uh, of course, uh, the um, epidermal electronics is a, a very exciting representation of such design. And um, we were able to design a, a two-dimensional filamentary serpentine network, um, which is able to demonstrate a, a mechanical uh, even smaller than a, a pig skin. And uh, Professor Yi Hui Zhang also uh, developed a, a variety of those um, serpentine patterns such that uh, he, uh, he can uh, clearly uh, mimic this uh, whole stress strain curve for uh, skins. And um, because of the thinness and the softness of this uh, uh, electron, now we call them electronic tattoos uh, for human to wear. So um, those e-tattoos can be placed uh, on any part of the skin, for example, around human neck, uh, where it's uh, very uh, easy to deform and uh, uh, very uh, easy to wrinkle. We are able to measure the uh, neck electromyogram uh, when we speak different words. And by pattern recognition, we are able to recognize what you are trying to say, not through your voice, but through your neck muscle activity. And we're able to build a human machine interaction uh, game uh, based on neck EMG. Uh, at that time, the fabrication of uh, the uh, electronic tattoo uh, was uh, uh, using uh, MEMS uh, like fabrication in the clean room. So uh, as you can see, it includes the transfer printing of uh, uh, silicon nanomembranes, metallization, and uh, um, patterning of the circuits and building the devices layer by layer. This is a highly simplified schematic. Um, so the whole process is uh, based on photolithographic web process and uh, rigid wafer for handling purpose. And uh, as you can imagine, it's very time consuming and very costly. So at UT Austin, we are trying to look at a freeform manufacturing or digital manufacturing. Freeform means we don't want to use any mask or stencil. The first thing come to mind is uh, printed electronics, which is additive manufacturing. But there are many limitations, um, such as uh, the time taken for ink annealing. And uh, even after annealing, uh, the ink uh, still has a high, much higher resistivity compared with the metal. So they, uh, when they are made as the antenna, they can be lossy. And the silver or copper inks are um, uh, easy to oxidize and react with sweat. Gold inks are way too expensive uh, for disposable uh, electronic tattoo use. So therefore, uh, we start to look into subtractive manufacturing, uh, which is actually um, consistent with the uh, conventional PCB manufacturing process. Uh, we uh, use uh, mechanical or laser cutter plotter to selectively remove the region. And uh, we are able to use this process to process already sheet-like uh, thin films, such as the uh, copper, uh, gold, graphene, or even piezoelectric materials. And uh, it is uh, also um, completely dry process. So at first, uh, we started with a very um, uh, economic uh, desktop mechanical cutter plotter, which is designed for paper vinyl cuts. And uh, at the tip of this uh, cutting head, there is a little blade that is uh, able to um, move according to the um, imported uh, design patterns. And um, we immediately uh, try to cut, for example, aluminum foils. But uh, actually from my PhD study, I know that those uh, thin film, uh, freestanding metal thin films are not very stretchable because all the large deformation are focused at this uh, um, uh, single neck. So the global stretchability is very limited. However, if you uh, support the metal thin film by a strong and well-adhered polymer substrate, you are able to achieve more than 50% of stretchability without any fracture, without serpentine design. So it's intrinsically very robust. And the best example uh, of contrast I can give you is uh, aluminum foil, freestanding metal versus uh, um, this kind of uh, potato chip bag, which is the uh, polymer laminated aluminum. Um, you can uh, have a very intuitive sense uh, which one is more stretchable. 
And so fortunately on the market, uh, you can find those metallized polymer uh, as big rows. Uh, for uh, they are developed for um, RF shielding or thermal reflection purposes. So uh, we can directly buy those big rows of uh, um, gold on PET or copper on capital, or you can customize uh, from the vendor and uh, you laminate this uh, metal um, uh, polymer rise the metal sheet on a temporary support such as a thermal release tape and uh, you put into the cutter plotter, either mechanical or uh, laser, and you can form those uh, um, cutting seams. And um, then just uh, by um, heating the thermal release tape, we're able to deactivate the adhesive and remove the extras. And then the leftover circuit can be uh, easily pasted onto a target substrate, which could be a medical tape or a tattoo paper or directly on our skin. The whole process uh, only took us uh, 10 minutes and it is completely free form and dry process. As you can see, you can uh, repeat this process multiple times to cut and paste multiple materials and multiple devices onto the same substrate. And uh, you can directly solder microchips as I will show you later. Uh, it has almost unlimited size um, because we are not using any rigid wafer. And it is also uh, compatible with the row to row uh, process in the future. So this was our first cut and pasted electronic tattoo. My first PhD student was twisting my arm and uh, uh, he is now actually uh, working at uh, uh, Google. And uh, he is uh, able to show uh, those uh, mechanical reliability for uh, serpentine coils as uh, serpentine ribbons as well as uh, uh, straight ribbons have very different stretchability. And even after 10,000 cycles for those serpentine ribbons, uh, there is limited change in resistance. Before and after skin deformation, there is also um, almost a no change in resistance. So even just using this kind of a very um, simple passive um, electronic tattoo, uh, we are able to achieve uh, quite a few electrophysiological uh, uh, as well as um, thermal and mechanical sensing, as you can see. The key is to patch the e-tattoo at the right location to measure the right thing. On the chest, we measure ECG. On any muscle, we measure EMG. On the brain, we measure EEG. And uh, any part of the skin, we can measure skin temperature, skin hydration. And uh, by integrating um, uh, electrically conducted rubber, we can uh, measure uh, the uh, skin deformation uh, using those as uh, soft strain gauges. So um, the uh, intrinsic uh, merit of uh, uh, electronic tattoos compared with uh, conventional rigid electronics uh, lies in their uh, coupling with our skin. Under optical microscope, our skin is rough. And um, this is not our work. This is uh, from Professor Rogers work. So uh, we can see that only when the uh, device is uh, thin and soft enough, it is able to conform to the finest wrinkles of human skin uh, versus conventional rigid um, devices are sitting on our skin like a rigid board with very limited contact area, that is going to limit the uh, interface, um, uh, in, interface impedance to be a high level, and that can lead to a very low signal-to-noise ratio. And also, uh, when we have this kind of integration, we are able to um, limit the interface uh, uh, relative motion, even when the skin is under large deformation. And that can minimize a lot of motion artifacts. And it can also enhance the interface thermal or mass transfer. So we um, actually performed a lot of um, uh, analytical modeling uh, to review how thin and how soft you need the ETA2 uh, to achieve 100% uh, conformability. That is one. So um, as we can see, uh, our prediction for Ecoflex on skin, uh, only when it's uh, thinner than seven micron, it is able to achieve 100% conformability. And that is uh, fully consistent with the experimental findings. 
And uh, also interestingly, once we exceed seven micron thickness of the ecoflex, it's going to uh, drop the conformability in, um, significantly all of a sudden from 100% to 24%. That is a, a snap through instability in mechanics. And um, then at 36 micron thickness, almost uh, uh, no conformability, almost no conformability here, 100 micron, uh, forget about it. So therefore, um, actually, uh, a visiting student, uh, Yu Hua Wang from uh, uh, Huazhong uh, University um, is the HUST is able to demonstrate this kind of uh, um, uh, limited motion artifacts in uh, ultra thin E tattoos. So uh, this is Yu Hua's uh, picture. And uh, we are able to uh, show even um, uh, comparing with uh, wet gel electrodes, which is uh, uh, the gold standards, the ultra thin E tattoo is able to uh, show immunity from the motion artifacts. Um, the slightly thicker dry E tattoo uh, has the motion artifacts similar to the gel electrodes. So this shows uh, the uh, importance of the thinness and softness of the E tattoos. So also um, in Yu uh, paper, uh, he was able to demonstrate the uh, asynchronous measurement of multimodal physiological signals such as the skin temperature, skin hydration, uh, ECG, uh, using one piece of multimodal ETA2. As you can see at that time, uh, we still use uh, uh, gold um, connectors to connect it to this ETA2. And we were uh, heating up the uh, subject we can see the temperature rising lead to also uh, sweating. And when it's full of sweat, however, on the interface, we still measure very reliable ECG signals, as you can see in a blow up view here. And uh, it's, the sweating is not affecting the performance of the E tattoo. So um, after Yohua returned to uh, Hua Zhong Kuda, he um, also uh, engineered this uh, very large area, multi-channel uh, e-tattoos uh, for uh, electrography at scale. And uh, he was able to put this uh, large area multi-channel e-tattoo on human arm, on human chest uh, for multi-channel ECG or uh, other uh, locations that has the uh, highly curvilinear surfaces. He developed a very innovative uh, uh, transfer printing process, and he was also able to compensate for the uh, um, noises coming from those long interconnects. That is a real challenge for large area sensing. So hopefully our paper uh, can show you more details as it comes out. And um, he was able to train a machine learning algorithm such that um, if the algorithm can recognize our um, 26 alphabet sign language uh, um, through this kind of 16 channel arm EMG. And of course uh, we can uh, control processes and uh, many other things uh, as a reliable human machine interface. So um, when we have um, uh, those kind of uh, mechanical motion um, for EMG, we also confirmed that uh, under long term, uh, up to six hours, and under a variety of uh, motion, we are able to uh, maintain the high signal to noise ratio for E tattoos compared with the um, conventional uh, rigid box uh, dosis EMG systems. And this is uh, again thanks to this uh, robust interface between the two. So uh, therefore, uh, because the bioelectronics interface is so important and uh, we are not um, uh, uh, really uh, trying to uh, increase the interface adhesion too much, therefore the goal becomes uh, uh, looking for the thinnest material uh, to have the best conformability. And of course the word thinnest material is 2D materials and uh, we are uh, able to build a graphene-based electronic tattoo, uh, which has combined a thinness and um, stretchability, um, comparing with um, other materials like uh, hydrogels and uh, liquid metal. They are very stretchable, but uh, usually the devices made out of them have a certain thickness. 
And in the middle is the, uh, a lot of nanocomposites. And uh, those are 2D materials, uh, conventionally not stretch, like too stretchable. And later, Professor uh, Takao uh engineered those uh, gold nano meshes, uh, also very stretchable and uh, ultra thin. So uh, the way we manufacture those uh, graphene e tattoos are uh, still using the uh, cut and paste dry patterning process, but uh, we have to do wet transfer for those uh, CVD grown monolayer graphene on copper using a PMMA um, temper uh, using a PMMA permanent support. We never dissolve away PMMA. And when we pick up the uh, graphene PMMA by layer, we make sure graphene is facing up. So after this wet transfer, there's no more wet process. Therefore, uh, the graphene surface is kept uh, very pristine and very clean. And because the graphene eta 2 is only um, 300 to 500 nanometer thick, dictated by PMMA thickness, we can easily transfer onto human skin without any adhesive. And um, we, of course, uh, uh, care a lot about the mechanical reliability of gets. So we tested the stretchability of a, a straight uh, get specimen without serpentine. Um, this uh, um, stretchability actually really surprised us because uh, we can see that uh, compared with the 100 nanometer gold on 300 nanometer PMMA, monolayer graphene on the same substrate has much better stretchability and the gold mm, just uh, uh, behave like a, a brittle material rupture at 1%. So this kind of um, uh, large stretchability, however, uh, does not mean graphene did not rupture. So uh, when we look into the uh, resistance and the slope of the resistance curve, uh, we actually, um, uh, with in situ observation of the uh, microstructure, we actually observed uh, four different regimes of the deformation. In regime one, that is between um, 0 to 0.9%, we uh, saw a lot of uh, we, we didn't see uh, any microcrack. There are occasionally defects in the uh, CVD graphene. And, um, but starting um, from 0.9%, we start to see uh, very micro uh, lens cracks uh, emerging in the monolayer graphene. But those cracks grow to a few micrometers and then they start to populate. They don't really propagate that long, but they become more. So that is the uh, um, from uh, uh, 2.5 to 8%. And eventually uh, they start to grow. And also the PMMA support start to have uh, macro uh, cracks. And those macro cracks eventually uh, kill the whole uh, stretchability. So ultimately it uh, fails at 18% uh, completely. So um, this uh, means uh, we uh, still have crack starting from 0.9% and therefore uh, the resistance will have a high hysteresis. And uh, we are going to um, study more about the cyclability and uh, improvement of the fatigue behavior of those kind of uh, GETS um, specimens. So here is a video showing the um, direct transfer printing of uh, uh, GETS directly on human skin by smearing some water on the uh, uh, temporary tattoo paper. There is a, a water soluble adhesive on the other side and we can directly transfer gets uh, simply like a, a temporary e tattoo, uh, a temporary tattoo. This work is actually um, published on ACS Nano very um, uh, efficiently. So uh, under optical microscope, you can see this transparency and the conformability of those gets. Because of those uh, transparency, when uh, we even wear the gets on human skin, you are not able to tell and you are not going to scare away your friends. So uh, here on human face, uh, we have those uh, electro-oculogram sensors around human eyes, but you cannot really tell. And we can use those uh, EOG sensors um, to uh, very accurately control the uh, motion of a uh, drone following our eyeball rotation. When we look up, the drone fly up. When we look down, the drone fly down. And from the front, there is no camera on the drone or anything. Uh, if I didn't tell you, you couldn't really figure out how we are 
are really uh, doing that. So we call this the imperceptible human robot interface. So moving on to a uh, really value uh, proposition, uh, we want to look into uh, significant unmet medical needs. Um, and uh, we identified um, hypertension and um, continuous blood pressure monitoring to be one of the most significant unmet needs. Uh, it is uh, um, currently the um, silent killer for uh, a lot of uh, uh, especially elderly patients. And currently there's no way for continuous blood pressure monitoring uh, except you use uh, this uh, uh, invasive arterial line, uh, which is inserted into your artery to uh, perform continuous blood pressure monitoring. This is the gold standard, but it's only used uh, mostly in ICU patients. So uh, we actually uh, proposed a um, indirect way to extract blood pressure uh, using the time, cardiac time interval for heart. So uh, here we developed, um, uh, uh, we, we tried to look into the uh, mechanical signal of uh, our chest due to heartbeat, which is called a seismocardiogram. And uh, we can see um, at every heartbeat, there are two sounds or two uh, vibration peaks. And only in this middle locations through this uh, digital image correlation study, we found that only at this middle location, we're able to measure both uh, very clearly. So we built a mm, dual mode ETA2 that can synchronously measure ECG and SDG. And um, the SDG peaks um, identified our mitral valve closing, aortic valve opening, those kind of uh, cardiac events. And by combining the two of them, we are able to extract all the cardiac time intervals, such as the systole, diastole, um, pre-ejection period, and so on and so forth. So uh, the systole represents how fast our heart contracts uh, in every heartbeat. And uh, um, the faster one's heart contracts, uh, which means the uh, smaller RAC interval, um, that gives us the higher uh, blood pressure value. So this is a, a empirical calibration curve to identify this kind of correlation between uh, systole and blood pressure. And using this kind of calibration and using this kind of continuous uh, systole measurement for every heartbeat, we're able to extract the blood pressure continuously, uh, even uh, when we have a very abrupt blood pressure change, when we, for example, internally uh, pressurize ourselves. And it compared very favorably with uh, a continuous and non-invasive blood pressure sensing system uh, in the market, which is based on pulse transit time estimation. So uh, as you can see, we still use the wires here. So to go wireless, uh, we need to leverage existing wireless technologies such as uh, near field communication or uh, Bluetooth. So they have their own pros and cons. Uh, near field communication is designed for one time reading like our um, access card, but uh, they have very low power and uh, um, the Bluetooth transmission can be large, um, long range, but they have very, uh, very high power consumption. So um, to uh, integrate uh, those kinds of uh, um, IC uh, chips onto our um, cut and paste ETA2, we uh, developed a cut solder paste process where we still uh, perform the cutting to define the circuits, the interconnects and the antenna but uh, we transfer the pattern circuit onto a, a water-soluble tape supported by a capton support, such that we can do direct soldering onto the uh, circuit. And uh, because the uh, capton has very high thermal budget, and therefore we can do the pasting and, and then um, water um, uh, soluble tape uh, dissolving. And at the end, we can end up with a uh, active ETA2 with uh, those uh, um, uh, integrated circuits. And uh, we can, of course, uh, stack up multiple layers of this uh, active circuit to form a completely wireless ETA2 with a disposable electrode layer, readout circuit layer, and NFC layer, for example. And um, they are designed into this um, modular um, concept such that um, our 
uh, wireless layer is uh, very generic. It doesn't matter what you are trying to measure. The uh, uh, radar circuit layer is customized for different uh, um, signal uh, um, acquisition. So for ECG, hydration, and uh, um, blood oxygen saturation, you can see the designs are different. But um, then those are different layers that you can uh, easily um, pick and customize depending on your use. This is the merged view. So um, here we demonstrate their um, sensing capabilities for ECG um, oxygen saturation. Here we are still using fingers, but it is possible to uh, directly measure uh, on the chest or on the neck. And uh, uh, temperature and the hydration, as you can see, we actually have to use a near field reader to both power and read from the ETA2 because the ETA2 is battery free. And even though we integrated those uh, rigid um, IC uh, chips, because of the uh, mechanical uh, optimization, they are still uh, very robust and bend such as bendable, stretchable, twistable, uh, and waterproof. So uh, when cell phone, NFC enables cell phone approaching the E tattoo, we can start uh, all the reading. So this kind of multi layer and modular design has a very uh, um, cute benefit, which is that after the measurement, we can peel off the ETA2 from our skin and then disassemble those different layers. Uh, we can um, disassemble and assemble up to 20 times and we can still continue to use uh, this ETA2. So the only caveat is that we want to dispose the bottom layer uh, that is the uh, passive electrode layer. Um, this uh, passive electrode layer is very low cost and uh, uh, not uh, uh, very uh, uh, troublesome to dispose. So uh, ultimately, we want to have a Bluetooth long range communication. Therefore, we need to integrate a battery but uh, the battery uh, is a very small coin cell battery. So we still need to have a, a wireless charging capability, um, not um, um, take by taking off the ETA2, but uh, while the ETA2 is uh, still working. So um, I'll demonstrate to you how. And here we are showing you the Bluetooth enabled wireless ETA2 simultaneously measuring a single channel electrocardiogram and single channel seismocardiogram and a three axis of uh, our body motion. And you can see that uh, when the subject uh, was uh, uh, set static, um, there is a very clear signal, but when he started moving, the ECG looked fine, but the SCG is very sensitive to those motion noises. To achieve uh, a charging on the go uh, purpose, we have to uh, design a strategy that uh, the cell phone can stay in our pocket instead of held in front of our chest. So we use this kind of uh, fabric feeding coil, uh, which is a piece of soft fabric with uh, a conductive silver coil sewed on them. So the idea is to repeat the electromagnetic field from the cell phone, which is uh, uh, safely placed in our pocket, to the ETA2, which is uh, beneath the shirt here. And we can see that uh, in this case, um, we are uh, able to have a two-stage charging uh, mechanism, which has a, an efficiency about 50% of the one-stage charging where your cell phone is directly facing the ETA2. So uh, this um, charging on the go strategy is able to extend the uh, wireless operation um, of our ETA2 uh, to be almost unlimited, just limited by our cell phone versus without charging, the coin cell can only work for uh, a few tens of seconds, uh, tens of minutes. So in summary, um, I have demonstrated to you some uh, um, uh, fabrication and um, application of uh, e-tattoos at different body locations. And um, there are many other uh, uh, cases that I'm not able to show today, but I just want to emphasize that this is a, a really robust and a versatile platform that can be put at 
different locations to measure different things. Uh, in terms of functionality um, of uh, like uh, sensing capabilities, uh, we can sense all those uh, physical signals um, as well as chemical signals where you uh, will, will hear from uh, uh, Professor Wei Gao in a minute and he can give you a very fantastic uh, view for this part. And ultimately, if we can have a sensor network, we hope to be able to do data fusion uh, to look at uh, not well-defined things such as the stress, uh, fatigue, or even uh, COVID-19, as uh, Professor Rogers uh, mentioned uh, in his EML seminar. And um, currently, we know that uh, in the US, there is a, a thermistor company called Kinza. And um, they collected their smart thermistors, which uh, digitize and upload um, users' uh, temperature. And they have a, a big data platform that saw the temperature rise of the population back in February. And they are um, able to predict the outbreak of COVID-19 in the US. So this kind of variables uh, with uh, uh, would able to provide those aggregated data um, to look at even population health and a pandemic uh, forecast. So um, with that being said, I also want to emphasize that um, because we can form such an intimate bioelectronics interface, we can also achieve uh, those kinds of electrical stimulation. Here we are trying to use uh, electrotactile stimulation to uh, give sensation to our skin. If it's uh, too weak, um, you feel nothing. If it's too strong, you feel pain because you are shocked. So uh, at the right combination of voltage and frequency, we feel the sensation and uh, we're able to deliver uh, communication to the skin or um, mechanical feedback to the skin. So um, uh, that is only one example. There are many examples that I'm not able to cover today, uh, but I borrow this uh, um, uh, uh, picture from uh, Professor Daehyung Kim's paper and I modified a little bit to try to uh, really show you a vision for future bioelectronics, no matter uh, invasive or non-invasive. Uh, we need to have those uh, sensing capability and uh, hopefully data processing and the analysis capability either on the tattoo or in the cloud, and then uh, provide those uh, information to um, medical care providers to come up with the diagnosis and treatment plans and eventually deliver those uh, treatment or uh, therapeutics also uh, using the e tattoos. Uh, of course, uh, energy and the power supply is a big bottleneck currently. And as you heard from MISO, uh, there are many, many efforts in this area already. So looking forward, um, I see this uh, area to have a, a lot of future opportunities in uh, different disciplines. We need uh, continuous uh, innovation for new materials, uh, electronic circuit design, especially ultra low power uh, integrated circuits, the mechanics for the uh, uh, integration and interface, bioelectronics interface, and uh, different manufacturing methods for those kind of especially long term uh, uh, high fidelity wearable sensor network. Um, the uh, data handling is uh, another very active area um, uh, by data scientists uh, because now we can provide them with uh, so much uh, new data. And uh, um, it's important to uh, really um, have a passive operation uh, for uh, our users because um, they are not able to spare attention um, to uh, any wearables. And ultimately, um, our ultimate goal is to really close the loop of sensing, uh, maybe edge computing or cloud computing, diagnosis and therapeutics, all on the wearable e tattoo. Of course, there are many challenges ahead because of the lack of ground truth. Outside of clinical settings, uh, we have to do tons of uh, uh, experiment to establish those ground truths. And we have to identify those digital biomarkers uh, clearly, uh, especially for uh, things like stress, depression, those are not very well defined. And uh, the quality of data, uh, especially due to motion artifacts and the environmental effects 
and sweaty in fact and so on are, are still um, a big uh, issue and uh, we of course uh, care about our uh, users safety and uh, privacy and uh, we also need the buy-in from all the stakeholders such as uh, patients doctors uh, insurance companies regulatory agencies and after you consider all of those stakeholders you realize that maybe at the end technology is a very small piece but it is the fundamental uh, uh, enabling tool to make all this happen with that let me acknowledge my group at ut we went for a speeding car uh, racing car competition and uh Hyo yang is the one who developed the uh, wireless uh, um E tattoo and he won the championship uh, with his girlfriend and he is now a postdoc with Professor John Rogers. And um, we are very grateful for our uh, financial sponsors and a special thanks for um, uh, Alice uh, of organizing this uh, uh, global uh, tech uh, um, webinar which is uh, able to really uh, share the uh, best and uh, uh, foremost uh, of our uh, science uh, uh, advances. And uh, um, uh, again, uh, special thanks for um, uh, Paul and uh, Yuri's dedication uh, for this uh, uh, platform and for the uh, big honor. And uh, finally, I want to uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Okay, great. We came to the question part. Terrific, thank you. I think uh, that was that was just a tour de force in uh, what one can do, and especially in in setting up uh, a new lab in uh, such a, a short time. Um, I can see that Alice has the question on her. Uh, it is on. Hoping yeah. it moves over to Baidu. There we go. So the first question uh, is uh, for the laser subtractive technology in addition to increasing the accuracy and reliability of the equipment itself, how does one increase the consistency of processing through other means, such as material selection or graphic design? Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Yes, uh, that is uh, um, actually a great question because uh, currently um, we are able to use uh, the laser processing for not just a monolayer or, or uh, freestanding material, but also uh, multi-layer materials. So for example, uh, I mentioned that uh, we should uh, use polymerized metals in films instead of uh, freestanding metal foils. That it, uh, also that comes from a mechanics consideration. And uh, for 2D materials, we are not directly processing monolayer graphene, but we're processing um, PMMA-supported graphene, and uh, we're able to see the uh, effect of uh, PMMA in terms of the mechanical reliability of those uh, graphene electronic tattoos. So those are uh, two examples I gave. And uh, in the future, when uh, you want to um, design uh, this kind of uh, optimized uh, manufacturing process, uh, you have to consider not only the uh, material uh, property, for example, the uh, laser material interaction, but also the mechanical property of your uh, ultimate um, device um, by layering materials or by even uh, 3D uh, design of the uh, uh, lattice structures, for example, like uh, you, uh, um, uh, Miso mentioned, uh, the laser is very powerful and uh, the uh, resolution and uh, cutting quality uh, is uh, uh, requiring a lot of optimization. Good. Terrific. Uh, next question. Have a delay while it comes up on Baidu. There we go. Uh, no, that's the same one. Paul, can you see that? Yeah, I I uh, can't see it in in Zoom only in Baidu. There we go. Professor Liu, very nice talk. For the electronic tattoos, uh, is it only always one layer? Can it be multi layers? I think you already answered that. And uh, if it's multi-layers, how do you get alignment? 
Yeah, thank you. I didn't uh, really talk details about alignment uh, because currently it's uh, manually aligned. I guess the speak uh, the uh, um, uh, audience is asking about uh, our multi-layer modular design at the end. So uh, in that case, uh, first we engineered VS um, between each layer and uh, we are able to use actually our long horn pattern, uh, not just for advertisement for UT, but also as alignment markers uh, between the layers. So uh, in the future, of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, digital alignment technologies that we can leverage if we want to uh, automate the uh, multi-layer lamination process. Very good. And actually, while well, the next one comes up on Baidu, let me ask you, uh, how reproducible are the signals and the devices that you make, and how difficult is it to associate uh, those signals with uh, biomarkers that, for instance, a, a clinician uh, might uh, want to have or use? Um, it's, not the, it's not the question on the screen. We'll come back to that one in a minute. So my, my, I slipped in a question. Which one? I, I slipped in my own question. Sorry, Alice. Okay, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, uh, can you uh, speak that again? Yes. The question is, uh, how reproducible from one to the next are the devices and the signals, and how difficult is it to associate these new, you know, uh, signals that you record with biomarkers that are known, for instance, uh, by clinicians? Uh, right. So um, the repeatability is uh, varying a lot uh, depending on the uh, type of the um, uh, signals we're acquiring. For the uh, electrophysiological signals, those are uh, the most repeatable, and uh, they have a very standard, um, very nice established gold standards, and uh, we have to uh, perform all those uh, uh, correlation analysis and statistical analysis to confirm, uh, or, or we call it the non-inferiority tests of our um, wearables. For other um, signals such as uh, the mechanical signal, the uh, uh, chemical signal, uh, those are really uh, emerging signals uh, which don't have uh, much gold standards. Uh, for example, for our seismocardiogram, uh, we were using the digital image correlation. There are also uh, stethoscopes out there to listen to the heart, which is also acoustic mechanical signal of the heart. Uh, induced chest vibration. Uh, in those cases, they are not exactly the same signals. So there are um, a lot of work to be done to establish those ground truths. Terrific. Um, and then uh, the next uh, question from our audience, uh, Dr. Liu, amazing technology. Uh, how about the power issue of these multifunctional electronic tattoos, uh, including uh, what is the power consumption and how do you supply power? Uh, right, so uh, currently we are uh, using the uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, wireless transmission technology. It's the uh, standard um, uh, Bluetooth low energy technology with the power consumption of a few milliwatts. So uh, currently we are able to use the uh, near field communication, also commercially available NFC technology uh, to deliver this kind of uh, a few milliwatts of power. And uh, we showed that uh, we can use a, um, a fabric feeding coil to uh, achieve the charging on the go um, uh, objective such that we don't have to take off the ETA2 to, to place it on the charger and then replace it on the skin. So uh, by using this uh, charging on the go strategy, uh, we hope to achieve a long-term uh, continuous monitoring ultimately, for example, three days or seven days. Uh, that would provide a lot of valuable data to um, also study the circadian rhythm or sleep um, disorders or um, uh, many other human performance tracking kind of purposes. Fantastic. Um, let's see, the next one is just coming up. Um, so give me one second while it appears in the other format. Uh, 
Okay. Did you get it? Uh, the, uh, it'll. It. There's just a delay getting over to Baidu. The. Okay. The, yeah. There we go. Um, do you think about using this technology to help traditional Chinese doctor doctors pick up biosignals uh, to uh, presumably uh, detect uh, their effect and follow their course of of uh, of action? Yeah, this is a really uh, emerging uh, field. Uh, we have not done much in this field, uh, but for example, uh, Professor uh, Xue Feng in Tsinghua University has uh, published uh, papers about uh, highly sensitive pressure sensors that can measure uh, the full pulse wave on the wrist. And that uh, is uh, actually a, a traditional uh, Chinese medicine um, method to tell the health of a, a subject by using our fingers to feel the uh, pulse waves. That's uh, um, how we conventionally do it, but it is totally possible to digitize the pulse wave and analyze the patterns to uh, really uh, uh, give uh, the uh, all the doctors uh, uh, information about uh, the pulse waves, uh, not just highly experienced and highly uh, and uh, doctors with highly sensitive fingers. So that is just one example. There are many possibilities. Yes. Very good. I, I think we're going to have to move to the panel uh, rather than continuing with the questions, but we will forward. Uh, questions okay. to you and the other uh, speakers. Uh, we thought we would impose upon all three of our rising stars to uh, talk a little bit about their careers and about how uh, how you developed your research program and also uh, about how in the current situation uh, you're able to uh, work with your group and to uh, reach out through the world. Uh, before that, I uh, want to present you uh, with this uh, certificate, uh, thanking you for being uh, one of our Rising Star lecturers uh, in advance for the piece that you'll be writing for us, and also for your advice uh, for the journal in helping guide uh, not only the future of the journal, uh, but the future of our field. Congratulations on, on everything you've done and on this, on this uh, particular uh, recognition of it as well. Uh, thank you. Okay, as uh, Paul said, we move to the dialogue part for the ACS Nano Rising Stars. Okay, I'm coming. So, yeah, Meso, Nanshu, Wei, Yuri, Paul, please, you know, yeah, turn on your camera. Yeah, we got here. Okay, uh, Paul, it's really excellent. I thank you very much for you know having all these rising stars getting on the stage. I feel really proud of them. Like uh, just our Miso and uh, and I should really deliver wonderful talks. You already uh get come out the questions whether we want to you know talk in this dialogue part. We want to you know get all the young stars to say something about uh, your group. Yeah, like this. Okay, Paul, please. Yeah. Yes, maybe let's start each with how did you choose the problems to address when you started your research groups and how do you choose to evolve those as you, you know, as you go forward? Maybe let's start uh, first with Nanshu, that we have you up and then we'll go to, to Miso and then we'll go to Wei. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I'm very flattered to be still called Young Stars <laughs> because I <laughs> am uh, much uh, more senior than uh, Miso and Wei, but I am uh, uh, really uh, honored uh, to be uh, still considered as the uh, rising. So, that's very encouraging. And um, I have uh, three uh, points to make. Uh, for uh, developing uh, an academic career. Um, so first, uh, I think that's uh, uh, the, uh, very important, like Paul said, uh, how do we pick a topic for our independent research? And uh, um, my perspective is that uh, we need to have a vision, a vision that mm -hmm. is um, decades in the future, looking forward uh, into decades in the future. 
and uh, we have to do everything uh, possible to make it come true. Maybe not uh, within um, two or five years, but um, ultimately it is our vision and it is our responsibility to make it come true. And um, I'm a fan of uh, Elon Musk, as you can see, and um, because I um, really appreciate his vision. So we uh, say he is the lost child from Mars and he's doing everything he can to return to Mars. Um, and his goal is to achieve interstellar transportation. And to do that, he needs um, uh, recyclable rockets to reduce the cost. Uh, he needs uh, um, energy storage as, such as uh, um, um, lithium ion battery. So he created Tesla and uh, he needs uh, transportation on the planets. So he has the boring company for the super loop transportation and he needs uh, collaboration between human and machine. So he has Neuralink to establish that interface. So I think we can learn a lot from, and I, I don't know how, when we can achieve interstellar transfer, uh, like uh, transportation, but that is uh, uh, how powerful a vision could be. Mm -hmm. And my second point is that um, if uh, we uh, uh, want to achieve this vision, uh, we have to learn, uh, 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 have lifelong learning from everybody uh, we uh, can encounter from our uh, colleagues, uh, collaborators, and even our students in the day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And uh, we um, just uh, cannot uh, be satisfied with the, uh, what we have learned in mm -hmm. um, PhD or postdoc. We have to uh, keep uh, expanding our uh, domain technology and uh, because we have to do everything possible to uh, realize our vision. And the last point is that um, we also uh, don't need to be shy to ask for help whenever we need it. Um, uh, sometimes we are afraid of uh, bothering or wasting mm -hmm. uh, colleagues uh, or, or mentors' time. Um, but um, I think the best way for us to pay back uh, is actually to pass this tradition of helping junior uh, colleagues and uh, um, scientists in the community um, uh, in the future uh, by helping um, the scientists junior to us. Uh, that is a way to pay back to the community because they are uh, carrying this tradition so well and we should do the same thing. Thank you. Super. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, Basil? Mm -hmm. um, I think Nanju gives me some challenges because she mentioned everything great already <laughs> and then that I have to say, I guess. <laughs> so, I have to add, I, I want to add one more thing about that. So, when I chose the topics of metal materials or before that energy harvesting, the reason why was, it might be a cliche, but uh, the reason why I chose those topics is because I love them. I didn't know why but it didn't go away. So I mm -hmm. I have so many opportunities to see many, many, many topics, research topics like from conferences and everywhere. But sometimes some specific topics didn't go away from your mind. And if it lingers, you can start studying. And then if it still stays there, then you need to jump in. And that uh, gives you some other way and that, give, that shows you the way to go through. And that's how I stepped up and um, up to now, and these days I have some another keyword that I have in mind, and that's lingering. So hopefully I can make some uh, different field out with those keywords. But like, um, not I, I'm not talking about just the instinct. So once you love it, you have to study, with, even though it gives you some hard time to understand. Because for me, meta materials, uh, the physics and mathematics, it was so challenging to understand in the beginning. So there's a really a big um, like activation barrier to jump over. But now I think I'm getting used to it and I feel more interested in that, in that topic. And I'm trying to integrate that topic with other um, intriguing topics. So, so in addition to all those nice things Nanshu said already, and I'd like to add one more thing about the affection about the research topics. So, okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. And Wei? Uh, I totally agree with what Nanshu and Miso said. And I think uh, uh, everyone has a 
bigger picture, at least uh, which topic you want to work on. It could be energy, it could be healthcare. For me, I really like to work on uh, medical technology for human health. But after you pick the big topic, actually, regarding the research, how to pick your research project, how to res uh, pick your research specific topic, right? I think the most important is understand what is the big problem right now? What is the real challenge right now in this field? What is missing uh, uh, right now? So what, where is the gap, basically? How can we tackle the problem and bridge the gap? So uh, for me, uh, my experience is talking with people. So when I meet, uh, for example, if you want to work on healthcare, you cannot avoid talking with clinicians uh, or like medical scientists. So when I'm talking with them, uh, I realize that something what I originally want to do may not be that important because they have some real problem, what is uh, actually challenging right now in their mind. So after discussion, actually, we found the right direction. So we think for them right now, we are, what we are working on is a variable, really chemical molecule sensing. We think that is right now the big gap, what is missing in the medical technology field. So after we pick the right topic, uh, well, uh, certainly uh, which kind of disease, which kind of markers, that's also we need in close interaction or discussion with uh, uh, clinicians. After we pick the topic, actually, what we can do as a professor is really assemble the right team, build your research group. So I'm uh, very grateful for my like uh, all my current members right now. I think uh, we pick the right people from different fields, how to work together uh, collaboratively. And uh, also, uh, super importantly, also Nancy mentioned, uh, I think uh, working with others. Uh, no one knows everything, especially in such an interdisciplinary field of medical technology. Right? I think uh, choose the right collaborator and work closely with them really save us a lot of effort and uh, we can actually make a big progress in this field. That's what I want to say. Okay, Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. So inspiration, going and gathering data from others, finding what it is that you love and gets you out of bed every morning and then relying on your your students and mentors for help those those are all wonderful pieces of advice from from our three rising stars uh let's go on to the the current situation uh what is it that you're trying is there is there some way that you're uh working with your groups or with others around the world where you know uh we have this long period where we it's difficult to travel uh, many of us can't go into the laboratory uh, or if we do, it's for you only special, special circumstances or experiments. Uh, maybe we'll go uh, backwards this time, uh, starting with Wei and then Amizo and then Nanshu. Uh, well, uh, current situation is pretty challenging because uh, right now much, uh, the school has been locked down for like several months. So we have to uh, find a way to still work together and uh, make good progress. And what we found is uh, really there are several approaches. So firstly, and uh, some students uh, that could dig a bit more fundamental problem, do the computation simulation at home. And we still uh, remain our group meeting, um, of course, virtually. So in this case, we can also track the progress of a student. Uh, some student can write a paper, write a review, for example. And also uh, we found another important aspect that we want to contribute because right now we face the humanity, the problem, uh, the challenge of the humanity is really COVID-19, right? So we uh, actually have a project that like, work on tackle the problem for COVID-19 uh, management and test. So we, um, because we are working on medical device field and we have multiple members working on this topic, we think we can make more contribution at this special time to this field, to our healthcare. Okay, cool. Very good. And uh, Miso? Yeah, um, um, the thing is, I'm in Korea, so we are kind of leading our normal routine, um, except that uh, we have to wear masks all the time. Um, uh, the, the wearing the facial mask all the time, even the meeting. or So we, we are cautious, but we are trying to get back to the, um, you're just leading our normal life. Um, so um, I feel a little bit guilty to other people all over the world. My sister is staying in the United States and she's in lockdown for one month with her baby and she cannot go to her school. Um, so, uh, the, but, but here it's the same. So we trying to uh, keep uh, the meetings virtually 
so that we can get cautious and we can become cautious about everything and then not to make worse things um, from, from the current situations. And this time I learned a lesson that we have to be more proactive to get connected with other people by emails and then to ask for some like Zoom meetings like this. Otherwise you can be really isolated from ideas. And then from this platforms, from this kind of platforms, we have more opportunities to learn something from other people, but it's not really interactive uh, sufficiently. So the way to overcome these problems is you have to be proactive yourself and then um, ask for um, interactions, like for even virtually, all over the world, from your friends and from your colleagues, and that's what I'm trying to do. And I feel so sorry for other people all over the world because I'm, uh, yeah, I can work in my office right now. So. <laughs> well, that's a good okay. news, we know. Yeah. yeah, in Korea, we are in a Kind of relatively a good situation so wearing masks is the only option <laughs> mm -hmm. and andrew yes so uh um like a uh, way mentioned um some of our experimental lists uh started uh, to show uh simulation talents which is uh, really surprising <laughs> and uh, um, encouraging <laughs> <laughs> and um, also, I uh, try to focus on uh, polishing my students' uh, writing skills because uh, they are usually so busy with uh, coursework and uh, lab work and uh, they don't have time. But now we have plenty of time to even read some uh, uh, writing advice articles or books. Uh, I, I hope uh, they can appreciate how important writing is uh, for uh, scientists, we are ultimately uh, writers, essentially. Um, and also, uh, it is uh, a good time for us to uh, brainstorm just uh, thinking wildly, uh, looking into the future and uh, uh, into our vision. So uh, I uh, actually um, appreciate uh, this uh, time of uh, uh, break uh, with um, both myself and also my students. Okay. Those are, so. all, those are all great, great activities. So take time for things that are difficult otherwise thinking and connecting and writing and improving and, you know, amplifying what uh, Miso said. I actually took a class this quarter from one of the other ICANX speakers, Shen Gu, teaches a drug delivery class in bioengineering. <laughs> And since I was home anyway, I thought it'd be great to learn uh, what he had to say. And I could see there, as Miso said, it's a little more difficult to interact. And the students and uh, in the class who had more to say and interacted more just obviously got so much more out of the class. So to the students and postdocs out there, you know, by all means, speak up under these circumstances. You know, we're waiting to hear from you uh, when we teach or give a lecture. And it does take it, as Miso said, it takes an extra effort, but it's better for you, it's better for the other students, and it's also better for the, the professors and lecturers or, or whoever it is you're interacting with. And it does take an extra effort, and it is awkward, you know, to speak into the void, uh, you know, as we're each doing in our own homes or offices now. But, you know, Alice, you've done an amazing job uh, <laughs> connecting us and connecting the world. And we so appreciate uh, what you're doing here and what you do every week and the phenomenal enthusiasm and vision uh, that you had to put this together. And so okay, think... thank you so much, Paul. Actually, I feel really great for this Rising Star Park. You know, today we achieved numbers really high, much higher than last week. So I think all these rising stars really attractive. Hi, uh, Yuri, did you have any words to add in efforts here for the young generations? How? Well, you know, I think uh, we all have heard uh, very uh, good advices uh, from our rising stars. And I agree with everything uh, what has been said, and we have been doing in my lab a lot of the same things. Uh, my students uh, uh, got more time to analyze their results, dig deeper into the data uh, rather than uh, go to the lab and make another experiment. And we found some interesting trends. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we started a journal club in my group that weekly wow. we discuss interesting paper from the field. And also I encourage my students and postdocs to listen to these numerous talks online, including, of course, I can X <laughs> talk. And actually one of my postdocs, like uh, 10 minutes ago, already sent me a comment on Nan Shu's lecture and he uh, got an idea uh from the oh, wow. electrodes how he can apply to his uh, uh two-dimensional maxine antennas uh, research wow uh, so i think wow. it's really inspirational it's really helpful and uh, i think uh, even when uh, uh, pandemic is over and the world hopefully uh, will go back uh, to normal whatever the new normal uh, will be uh, we will still uh, use a lot uh, from the online communication, online presentation, uh, skills, practices that we have uh, been developing uh, during this difficult time. Okay, it is great. Hi, Paul. Due to the time, I think we need to go to the next session. Yeah, so it's your time to announce for this second one. <laughs> okay, shall I introduce or I? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so our, our third rising star, is a Wei Gao from Caltech. He was an Oh, no, no, no. So, oh, pa, I get an introducer. Okay. That's no, what no. I was asking. Yeah. Uh, so, oh. Paul, uh, sorry about that. You see that delay. So, I want to announce for the second ICAX, ACX, Metal oh, Rising okay. Stars Lectures. That's got on it, the screen. Got it, got it. Yeah. Right. So, we will go. be yes. same top 10 or first. Yes. Yeah. So, right. you go so ahead. Our, sorry, um, our yeah, second set of rising star lectures